everyone and welcome to tonight's edition of the Berkeley Forum. My name is Cindy and I'm the current president of the organization and tonight we're super excited to be hosting two incredible speakers, Joanna Kahlo and Caroline Williams. Before we begin, we have a few logistical items that we'd like to share that will also be posted in the Facebook live stream. So if you're attending today's event, we would love if you could fill out our attendance form so we could gather some metrics. And if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to submit them at the tiny URL there. And again, these two links will be linked in the event description as well as in the live stream. And without further ado, I'd like to invite our event manager for tonight, Senna, um, to introduce our speakers. Hi everyone, I am so excited to introduce our speakers for today's talk. First, we have Joanna Kahlo. She is a writer and mother who lives in Ojai, California. She's currently a co-executive producer on Hacks for HBO Max. Past her past writing credits include Showtime's The Auteur, The Babysitter's Club on Netflix, Amazon's Undone, and six seasons on the critically acclaimed BoJack Horseman. And she's been nominated for a Writers Guild of America Award. Um, and next, we have Caroline Williams, who has written on shows such as The Office, Modern Family, BoJack Horseman, and many more, um, and has won a Writers Guild of America Award for Modern Family. Prior to joining these shows and others, her original pilot, Misguided, aired on ABC. And as a director, her experimental short, Lovely, screened at festivals around the country. That's cool. Hi. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. <laughs> it took me a minute. Thank you, Senna, for the introduction. And we'd also like to invite our moderator for the evening to the stage, Oriana, and we will kick off the event. Hi. Hi. Thank you, again, Joanna and Caroline, for speaking with us tonight. We're very excited to have you with us. Uh, I, again, I want to remind everyone in the audience that we have a question form pinned in the comments. And we'll be taking a few of these questions at the end, so feel free to submit throughout. So I want to begin by asking you both, how did you get your start in screenwriting and what made you interested in pursuing a career in this field? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll start. Um, I've always been a writer um, of, different, of different kinds of stuff. And I ended up studying playwriting in college. And when I uh, had a play, there was a festival called the Humana Festival. It's in Tennessee. And when that uh, play premiered, there were people in the audience from uh, LA and they said, you should consider writing for television. And from that moment, I, I um, figured that's what I was gonna do. I went to undergrad and grad school here in LA. So it was very much a like, it was in the world, it was possible, you know, if I lived in somewhere else, maybe it would be something that I wouldn't even consider possible, but it, it definitely uh, started, a, I would say, when I was still in college. And then I did internships and I was an assistant. And basically when I went back to grad school, that was what my focus was, which was uh, writing for film and TV. And then once, sort of once you're in school, it's it's a bit of kind of a training program for how to transition into like the professional world of i guess hollywood <laughs> tv writing and screenwriting whatever um i gosh i feel like i always people ask me this and i really should think about it before someone <laughs> asks me this. i was obsessed with movies as a kid um like all of us but um it really was just the thing i loved the most and cared about the most and uh i would wake up before school to watch movies and but when i went to college it still didn't occur to me that i could could do that for a job and so i actually was a marine biology major but then um they had a they had this awesome film program um, i went to uh, uc santa barbara and they had this wonderful film program and i ended up um switching um into that major and they suggested that we go and find an internship in between um like in between you know the summer and that internship led to a, a job i was became a pa on a tv show and i ended up 
being an assistant and kind of working for a really long time. I was actually an assistant for 10 years and I, I did end up going back to college and finishing my film major. I did try to get into Berkeley because that's where my parents were living. They rejected <laughs> me, just need to say that on record. Um, <laughs> they they me rejected down. me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then um, I, but I went back to Santa Barbara, but it was mainly being an assistant and um, I worked on lots of different shows and worked for producers and a lot of writers. And that's how I learned to write um, just by reading scripts and seeing how shows got made. Um, and yeah, end. Well, even though Berkeley might have rejected you then, we're very excited to have you now. <laughs> Uh, going more into touching more on what you mentioned in terms of your love of film, who are the major influences from your lives that have impacted your work today? Ooh. Oh, that's a great question. Good Do you have a good one, Joanna? I think like, um, like I think my, I, so for me, it's always been like high low where it's like, I remember being for a long time, I would say um, that like my favorite movie uh, was Mallrats, but then it was also like a lot of indie movies and particularly indie movies um, made by women or starring women, which like, you know, that like, that is a little bit more of a thing now, but it really wasn't that much of a thing <laughs> um, yeah. back in the day. And so, um, uh, yeah, like I, you know, I for a long time was very, into the film history that I learned about as well when I was in college, like getting to really learn about um, great filmmakers uh, and then kind of again realizing that none of those were women um, was very uh, interesting to me and, and kind of seemed like a place for for me to go and, and to make it better. And uh, sorry, I'm being very ineloquent. This is why Berkeley did not accept me anyway. <laughs> um, I, but I also, I really, really love the show Veronica Mars. Um, and that felt like such an important show, even though it was, you know, CW, whatever, it was like this amazing female character and it was unlike women I'd seen on TV before. And I found that to be like particularly inspirational as I kind of made that jump into actually being a, a writer just to try and do something like that. Yeah, I would say similarly, like, discovering in indie film like my favorite genre is is i don't know if it's a genre dark comedy and that tends to be more indie like the movies that i kind of i feel like i discovered them in my late teens and early 20s whereas as a kid it was like john hughes and you know kind of very 80s types of things and then in the 90s um sort of discovering like election and Citizen Ruth and I guess sort of To Die For was a big influence on me. These sort of not necessarily widely commercial movies that had often like a dark female point of view, whether or not they were made by women. I love the Coen brothers. I think they have really influenced, maybe like you can't see it in my work, but it's what I want to do like right like that. So those types of writers once i discovered them and then as far as like real classics i didn't have as much exposure to that until i was a student and that's when i went back and sort of watched i mean like the godfather and rosemary's baby and all these amazing kind of films from before i was born where i developed sort of an appreciation for like you know different genres like Dog Day Afternoon is one of my favorite movies. My number one favorite movie is probably a movie called Badlands um, starring Sissy Spacek and it's sort of this subversive teenage love story but I would never have seen that if I hadn't been studying film and so those kinds of unexpected voices now influence me more you know and then the older I get, the more I get excited about things like horror or genre, things that I didn't necessarily set out to uh, to do. I'm more interested in doing now, you know? So it just changes along the way. So one of those changes could possibly be described as your move towards producing and directing. Um, and both of you have worked in various roles behind the camera as producers, story editors, writers, and much more. 
Can you both explain what kinds of work you contribute in each of these roles and how that is or isn't reflected in the crediting process? Oh yeah, Joanna, do you want to explain like how that, because it's so yeah, I mean, I'll try. I'll I'll try, and then you can correct me. But yeah, the you know a lot of our a lot of our credits actually have to do with our guild, um, which is that like basically your experience bumps you up and that changes your title, but it's not consistent um, for actually what that title means um, in regards to the work that you actually do. But I mean, I think I think um, part of what you're asking is about like when you when you do start to move up and if you are making a live action show you know you will perhaps have more duties shepherding your episode um on on set um and that's kind of a, again a weird part of our process which is that the writer's room and production can be really separate um and so when you when you're producing you're actually going to set and kind of watching it be be filmed being there to punch things up or change things or talk actors through what's going on. Um, but that the reality is, is that like when you're show running, um, that's when you're really like making all of the decisions. Um, and that's kind of, there's so much of our job, which is done by staff and that's done together. But at some point it's really the showrunner's job to kind of take those, to make those decisions. Wouldn't you say Caroline? Yeah, it's so it's sort of a hierarchy. It doesn't always make sense, but the person who created the show, the <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's just so that we don't say anything. It's literally like, do not say anything bad about anything um, uh, about any of the shows we worked on. No, I would say yeah. If there's a hierarchy that's based on like how much uh, experience you have and and how much money you make and base and that's usually based on experience and then um that how if you created the show like those kinds of things all dictate what your title is so it starts with staff writer and then i think story editor and then you know co-producer or something like that it goes up but essentially they're all writers and at the producing stuff what the more experience you have sometimes with like uh, live action shows, you'll be part of casting or you'll be a part of post-production, you'll be in the editing room, just depends on the show. Like everything is different. Some of the the Netflix shows that I've worked on, and I'm sure this is the same for you, Joanna, where it's you write the show as a group and then you never see those people again, <laughs> or you never see, you never see anything filmed, you know? Yeah. So, um, and then sometimes when I worked on Netflix or network shows it's downstairs you know filming so and then you have to go down and and think of of new lines or uh help with various aspects of it but all those titles are just sort of varying degrees of, of writers so delving more into that process that you've talked about in terms of writing um can you give us a brief walkthrough of a process for a typical show, starting from when you write the episode to the production of that episode? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think like again, it, it does it does vary, but um, I would say the typical thing is that you come in and there's a writer's room and that means it's a group of people that are there um, who are going to come up with the episodes and come up with what happens in the episodes. Again, that's led by a showrunner, someone who both has the final decision making power, but also is sort of coming to the table with these ideas and sort of, you know, leading the staff to help figure out what goes on in all of the episodes. Then it's usually divvied up. So you, as a group, figure out what happens in each episode, but then they're assigned to separate writers. They go off, write the episodes, they come back. And then as a group, we give notes and edit and punch them up. Um, and, and then kind of it moves on to the next phase, which is production, which is for an animated show, it's voice recording and you just re you know record all of the, the, all of the actors come in and say the lines and then it gets turned into animatics and art and et cetera. But then for live action, um, like Caroline is saying, it kind of goes downstairs to wherever it's being filmed. <laughs> that's a whole, a whole yeah. thing. 
<laughs> um, yeah. That's it can be in another country. I mean, I think a lot of shows are shot in Canada, stuff like that, more drama than comedy. But um, yeah, it's like it can be far away or it can be really close. <laughs> So as you've mentioned, writers' rooms are typically comprised of multiple writers working together on the same uh, shows and ideas, pitching ideas, things like that. In a collaborative setting, how do you balance different styles of comedy and writing during that process? <laughs> you fight. Yeah, it can get <laughs> contentious. I mean, ultimately, I always say like, this is not the right expression, it's very negative, but like the fish rots from the head. So like, if the person in charge has a dominant style. It is a bit of the responsibility of the room to kind of cater to to that tone, you know? And I, I feel like at the same time, it's really helpful. To, I think if a, if a showrunner is a good showrunner and, you know, they've created a good show, they want to populate the room with different kinds of voices because you don't want a bunch of versions of yourself Otherwise you won't make any progress. But I do think like um, the best rooms are the ones where all the different voices kind of like are respectful and, and meld together. And even though people have different styles, it still kind of uh, leads to a good thing. And then some, I, some writers are just people just fight <laughs> over what they think is funny or what they, think makes sense or, you know, I mean, it's probably, it's just like any other job, I assume, where groups of people are forced to collaborate in sometimes very small rooms. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that there's also, there's, I mean, it's, again, it's, it's just also different, which is what's really exciting about it. And there are so many different management styles. And so I think like the nice version is very much like, you know, a showrunner who wants to hear from everyone and and letting passion you know kind of lead the way and and i do think there is a, a you know a general rule of kind of seeing what gets the most response from the most people and that's kind of how you do it but yes it's like a bad group project sometimes like when you did that in high school basically <laughs> just like yeah. who's loudest and like who's gonna give up you know right oh and the major caveat to all of this because is that every room is different everyone has different experiences my biggest fear in even doing this was that it would be that i seem like i'm speaking for like this is how it is in every if you ask 10 writers with 10 different levels of experience everyone will have a have a different like description of how these tv writers rooms work or even how writing in in um in the industry works but just from our point of view, this is sort of how it how it's gone so far. That's a great point. Um, additionally, uh, I'm curious, what if any are the challenges that that exist of making a cohesive end product when you have so many different conflicting voices in the room? Mm, it's hard. It's a good question. <laughs> I, it helps to have an end point already, like when you're starting. Well, oh, you're talking about like how do how do people collaborate or how do you get episodes that make sense? <laughs> sort of more the second, like how do you make a cohesive story arc when you might, uh, when different writers might want to take it different direction? Right. Well, that's where you trust the leadership. You know, I think good shows for the most part, like the person in charge, my, my opinion is that the person in charge has to be like very passionate and in love with the idea so much so that their momentum of what they want is so strong that it that it kind of um, encourages people to get on board. And if that person has like an end game in, in mind, you're all working towards that same thing, you know. And and sometimes you know if you if they did and and the studio throws it out, then you are starting from square one. But if you have somebody at the helm who's very passionate about their idea and is, is I, I guess, a good leader. I mean, Joanna, wouldn't you say it does come down to having I, a good boss? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's exactly as you said, that's the answer, which is like, 
you, it's there is a person who ends up making the, all the decisions. And so, and that's what's good about it. But also, yes, it comes down to them having a strong vision and, and kind of being able to pull the best of what they're hearing in order to, you know, track things through. Yeah. And have that person having really just as far as seeing people who ascend to that level, like they probably have, you would hope that they have really good communication skills to sort of explain their vision to, to other people. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of that process is, is personality. So if you have patience to sort of take the time and, and also be understanding if people don't quite understand, don't quite get what you're saying. Like th there is a personality type, I think that that's better suited to it. Or is if you just are very, you, you have to, you do have to be, I'm totally stuttering, but you do have to be, I, I don't want to say an extrovert because I'm an introvert and I still do this job. I mean, at the, not at that level, but yeah, I think you just have to be a good boss. Like any boss would have to be um, powerful without, without being, without squishing smaller voices, but having enough uh, vision. Well, I wanna pull out this thread that you mentioned in terms of uh, sort of navigating challenges with the network. Uh, since you've both worked on very popular shows, how do you balance, if at all, your own creative interests with those of the network or of the show's fan base? Well, I think I think the, the truth is that once you get past a certain point, when the show is successful, they leave you alone a lot more. So it's really about like yeah. getting to that level as, as quickly as possible, because I do think it's newer shows that the networks are kind of really feel like they need to help you the most, and they don't tr they don't don't necessarily trust um, trust the writers yet because you know it hasn't been proven, and and so I think it's about just getting to getting to that that next level as quickly as possible. But I mean, yeah, do, do they give notes to Modern Family, Caroline? Uh, I don't, I don't remember, but I doubt it. <laughs> like, like exactly what you said, like there is a, there's a point where it's undeniable that, that people know what they're doing and don't mess with it. You know, there used to be, I mean, I actually have not been in a position of authority in recent times where there were, um, focus groups, you know, where they would yeah. show, do that. Do you have focus groups? Yeah, they do that still. They do that. They, they do a lot of testing. Yeah, testing. Whereas if the testing comes back bad, then then it, everyone wants to fix these problems. But that's sort of a, a weird, um, imperfect system because a lot of stuff that turned out really great probably didn't test so well. So I don't know. It just depends. I think. Uh, that, the other thing is that some networks, it comes down to the person. Like there are actual like individual people at all these places. And if you are sort of collaborating with somebody who's very supportive of and trusting of uh, creativity or trusting of whatever particular voice the show is, then um, then that, that experience is, is wonderful. And it doesn't feel like you're burdened with like, the man telling you what to do but in other places that's that's a different person and that person is is more by the books and then it's less fun but uh so yeah it does i i feel like in my experience it really does depend on the person like the producer the executive those people uh more now than years ago like have the ability to be really supportive or not Okay, now I wanna ask a couple of specific questions about particular projects that you all have worked on. So this first question is actually directed towards Caroline, but Joanna, feel free to chime in if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, I'll answer so, it. <laughs> so uh, this is a question about The Office. Steve Carell has said that he doesn't think a show like The Office could be made in today's climate. 
How, if at all, do you think the the office would be different if it came out today? Oh, I'm sure it would be totally different. I think uh, I love the thing that I love about the office so much is that it sort of has transcended time. I mean, the amount of people who discover it who weren't actually born, I think, when it was made is is really cool. I've never seen something like that happen. Um, the main thing about The Office that I think uh, was unique at the time and would even maybe be unique now is that it wasn't cynical. It was a very uniquely um, hopeful look at something that could have been very depressing. So the fact that that lack of cynicism is, is something that feels very unique in today's climate because I think obviously times have changed, but I also think it's something that people maybe miss or, or only now appreciate how valuable that it was and how hard it is to do. Because if you do, you, you know, where cynicism is, is good, you don't want to be just, <laughs> just eating everything that people feed you. But I do feel like there was something special about that show in its, um, its hopefulness. And uh, I don't know that it would get me today. I don't know. I, I, I think it would. I think right now, especially people need people that. Want to know, yeah. Sure. But maybe not like two years ago. <laughs> and once, yeah, I don't know. Um, if Joanna, you don't have anything else to add, then I'll ask a more specific question. Uh, I don't have to <laughs> add to Caroline's answer. My, my uh, <laughs> overwhelmingly articulate like <laughs> analysis of the uh, television industry. I thought it was beautiful, Caroline. Okay, Thank sorry. You. Go on. You're fine. Uh, so Bo Bojack Horseman has dealt with a lot of mature topics like abortion, alcoholism, mental health issues, and sexual assault. How have you dealt with writing about a serious concept for a show that arguably presents itself as a comedy? Um, I think that, I think that the weird thing about all of it is that we start from a very serious place and, and then we put comedy on top of it. And I think ultimately that's how we all feel. I mean, as the writers walk around the world, it's like, everything's awful and also it's um, really funny and also there's there are good things about it even though I know that the world is awful so I think like that is kind of our that our stance on all these things which is like god can we just try and laugh about these things because they're so awful um so why don't we sort of both feel the pain and try to um distract ourselves from that. And so I think in a way there's like a tiny bit of hope in that too, which is like, what if, you know, yes, we're sad and things are bad, but also um, what's good about this and what, what can we, how can we laugh about it as well? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think that's sort of the way we see the world a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to add Caroline? No, I agree. It's a human coping mechanism yes, is exactly. to like, you know, laugh. It, what is it called? Um, gallows humor? Trench humor? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. I think also there's a, I think it's a little bit of a, a Trojan horse, which is like, how can we find ways to talk about these things that um, we really want to talk about and but we but we want to get more people to pay attention and listen and have this conversation and and comedy is always just a great way to lure people in <laughs> yeah i mean joanna wrote an amazing episode about abortion for bojack and it is something that like it's a topic that is so difficult to talk about especially with people that you don't know what where they're coming from but putting in it in this world where we all agree we want to be here and we love it and it makes you i think more people open to talking about something or at the very least facing it than maybe they would have if they hadn't watched the show you know so or been a fan of the show you're more inclined to engage 
because you already trust that they're going to make it fun, which you did. <laughs> make it fun. Yeah. <laughs> abortion. Make that abortion fun. Yeah. So unfortunately, for the sake of time, this has to be my last question before we move on to questions from the audience. So I want to end by asking, what impact, if any, do you hope to have on people through your work? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, for right now, I would just say there's value in entertainment when things are difficult. You know, I feel like like Joanna was just saying, like the ability to talk about unsavory things in a way that's unique or enjoyable, I guess. I'm not quite sure how to phrase that. Make it, <laughs> punch that up, Joanna. <laughs> what would you say? No, I think I, I think that's very clear and also awesome. And it's like, it's letting, using your work to, to have the hard conversations. And, and I, I mean, I think it's the same for me, which is like, I, I think secretly I always feel like we can connect people through television. And I say that as someone who like loves television so much. And there have been so many times in which it's made me feel connected even just to it. And that, that like, you know, uh, that like that idea of like, you are what you love and not what loves you. That like, basically I love this show I love these people it doesn't matter that they're fake I think that that always feels like um exciting to me that you could create something that someone would love and would make them feel connected and comforted but I think my like baseline goal has always just to be a woman writing and hopefully writing for women <laughs> and that like the more we can put women on screen and show them in different ways that that is um that is really powerful and that lets our lets our kids see just like what is and what's possible um and i think that's like oddly like very powerful um and so yeah hopefully we'll do that yeah you want you want i want i want there to be like when someone tells a joke and you just know yes that's exactly how it is you know and i relate to that and that person isn't me and they don't have my experience and they don't look like me and they don't this or that but whatever that message was like i totally relate and that makes it so funny like to be a part of that is is the goal i guess to have that sort of to share oh this is how it was for me you know yeah. what was it like for you just yeah. getting all that like i don't know it makes it sound very like existential but that is, that is sort of part of it. I love that. Yeah. So thank you both once again for answering my questions. We're now going to be moving towards the audience questions that we've collected over the course of the event. So um, for those of you out there, if you have any further questions, you can continue to submit them for, to the form pinned in the comments. I'm so excited that there's an audience at all. We can't see anybody. So I, as far as I know, it's just like Joanna's daughter downstairs <laughs> watching. <laughs> Let her use the computer. <laughs> OK, um, sorry, Oriana, proceed. So our first question is from Audit. Uh, they ask, how do you make a character feel real, not, i.e. not a character, if they don't have much dialogue? Mm, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, my go-to is, is turn inward. Like what is personal about me? Like what is that, like if me or someone I know to, to, to flesh out a character, even if they don't have words, what are traits or qualities of myself that are usually, because if you're writing comedy that are negative or that are uh bizarre and apply them to that character it, it for me it's always uh more it comes across more authentic when it comes from uh like myself I, I, if other writers are out there um you know when you're a student and you're writing fiction i feel like the best place to start it was for me is is putting a character that's not me but assigning them you know things about myself that maybe are harder to 
deal with in real life, I can put them on that character. I have no interest in writing about myself, but in a way, like when you write for characters, you are kind of writing about yourself. That's a long answer, but. <laughs> oh, that's good. I, uh, it's funny, I was like, oh, I should do that. I, I feel like um, it's also about like pulling, pulling people that you know or that you've yeah. seen. And I think like a good advice I never took is to like have a notebook and be like capturing things from real life can, and yeah. then like pull from them. But I never remember to bring the notebook. But like if you, you know, even if they don't have much w words, it's like a real person with a real name. I mean, uh, again, real is the wrong word, but I mean like really filling out the backstory. And I think especially now, um, when we sort of are trying to like add diversity in so many different ways, just being like, you know, all kinds of different names and all kinds of different descriptions, um, just to kind of make the world feel populated with actual people. Well, um, and I think, I yeah, and specificity to that effect. Yeah. Like if I say, you know, a specific type of person is I don't know, wearing something that's very specific to that sp person, it's it's more authentic than if I say, well, Joanna is a girl with brown hair and a purple sweater. But <laughs> if it's like, you know, Joanna's sweater, she bought at this store and it has a hole because yeah, that's she, she can't <laughs> get her shit together. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not saying your sweater has a hole. I'm just saying Joanna is the type of person whose sweater has holes. I like, specific my answer is specificity yeah that's you know? good. that's really good and, that, and i i think that is why like we're having all different kinds of voices in the writer's room is so important because i can't be specific as far as if i'm writing i need somebody who's lived that experience to help me with the specifics it's or to to give her, her specifics because that's that's not my reality, and I want it to be authentic. And the only way it's authentic on screen is if it's authentic behind the screen, you know. And that that just takes uh, different kinds of voices. That takes a lot of different people. I was just thinking that a good description for someone who doesn't say a lot for something that's happening right now would be like a man, a white man who's mat who's has his mask but it's not over his nose you know what i mean like that kind right. of like it says a lot who can't like doesn't yeah. understand the mask anyway yeah i don't know why i'm pitching stuff yes good answer but that is that's, that's no but that's exactly it and like that's very specific and then you could go into like what's on the mask like if they have truly if we're just pitching if they have no lines we're gonna make this person jump off the screen <laughs> you're gonna be like who's that guy in the back with the <laughs> nose he sucks he sucks <laughs> well thank you for that answer uh I'm gonna this question by somebody anonymous they, they say, comedy is such a subjective genre. What does what do you think it takes to be funny? And do you think that's changed over time? Ooh. I would say it's subjective for sure. So you just have to go with what you think is funny. You know what I mean? And if a lot of people agree, great. <laughs> and if, then you, you'll get your show on TV. And if you're the only one who thinks it's funny, like, it's no less funny, it's just an opinion, you know? I think it's more about like, I guess. Yeah, that's hard. What do you think? I don't know, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, Cause I think also you can be funny in so many different ways. There's so many people who, who write jokes and they, it is like kind of the math of jokes, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and like the setup and the punchline. And and I remember that as a kid, like the joke books, remember those, Carolyn? Yeah. And, like, and so it's like, you could like study those and understand. And then there's people who just have like an irreverent outlook on life and, and the world makes them laugh, you know, and they kind of see things in a skewed way. And then there's people who are just like naturally really funny. And it has nothing to do with performing or jokes it's just like an energy and I think like I do think that you probably need to laugh yourself to be funny but but maybe that's not even true I don't know yeah right. I I know people who know what's funny but they aren't funny if they're and, and maybe yeah, I'm one yeah. of them 
or maybe I don't know what's funny. I mean, it is, that's the whole, that's the point anonymous. You're so right. It is so, it's so subjective. Like who is, who is to say? Um, I feel like there was a point where it was like, well, happy people can't be funny. And then I'm like, well, I've met some happy people who are funny. I mean, not very many, but I know that that's possible. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so subjective. There's people that everyone thinks is funny that I'm like, I, I don't get it. And yeah. then there's people who like, I'm the only one that thinks they're funny, but like, I know they're funny. I don't know. It's weird. Yes, it is. It's a little, it's a little magical. It's a little like art. Yeah. Is that like, a, it's different and not yeah. everyone's gonna, gonna think it's good. Yeah, um, that anyway. makes sense. That's good. That's actually very true. Yeah. On a sort of related note, we have a question from Kelsey. Uh, they ask, do you feel a need to keep up with relevant topics in your shows or do you focus more on character development and the overall storyline of the episode? I, I personally I am more interested in character development. And I, I think like, I like, I mean, I think there's ways to talk about what's going on uh, in the world, but not naming it. That's just me personally. I'm not as interested in like the super topical stuff, but maybe it's because I'm like not smart enough. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, 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 I know. I feel like um, you have to be interested in it as the writer. Yes. I think like it, it's like if it's interesting to me or to the writer, then like that's worth exploring if it's topical, but I don't really care about it, you know, like this is on Facebook live. I'm not a member of Facebook, but so I would not be able to speak to that community. You know what I mean? It's not some, but, but I know there's a lot of like, um, I don't know, a, a lot of issues around like social media and all of that stuff. And it's just not, it's not something that I would, that I would dive into, but if it was, something that's on my front door and it's topical and it's the, and I'm dealing with it every day um then then yeah it would be it would be worth it but think, it does start with character I feel like that is number one yeah I think so I I think also just me personally I'm have like I'm more interested in the timeless things and I, I think so I many like so many things that are that are topical are timeless so it doesn't like it it, it sometimes they they cross but for me personally, it's also like those stories are just more interesting. But. Yeah, to that end, I also, and and just to, to keep hammering about Facebook, I feel like it's always better to, at least, I don't know, it's not always. My preference is to, is to mention topical things less so that your story isn't dated, unless you wanna date it in a specific time. If you're mentioning this particular topic that's 2020, then, or if you want to be writing something more timeless, you know, you don't want to be dealing with like only an iPhone 10 or, you know, you want it to be just whatever about the emotion. I don't know. I, everyone has to have a phone. So <laughs> Facebook is good. I don't know what to say. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm so glad that Kelsey is even asking a question. <laughs> There's somebody out there named Kelsey who's watching this. I'm so excited. Uh, we have another question from Anonymous, or someone anonymous. Um, of all the episodes you've worked on across different shows, what were your favorite and least favorite ones? Hmm. I'll go first, just because my favorite was The Office, because it was my first. Uh, there's, It was just, like, mind-blowing to be um, on a set with that level of people and to know that I had written something and that they were all gathered there to make it. It was just, it was, it was, it was just, you just don't forget that. It's like your first job or, you know, whatever. First boyfriend. I don't know. <laughs> Very much. It, <laughs> it, like it was, uh, the office, the episode was Phyllis's wedding and Phyllis and Bob Vance got married. And I, I just remember like, you know, it was a network show and it was shot at the same place it was written. So I got to go and, you know, they had, 
like rented this giant church. It was just, it felt like the scope of it was, was sort of mind blowing. It was just very exciting. So I'll never forget that. And the worst? Oh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the worst, it's, it's hard to say because because <laughs> so many of them were so bad. Yeah, no, I would say like, there's so many, you know, maybe maybe this will be instructive to the audience where there's so there's a lot of times where where it says written by or you have a credit on something and you didn't actually do anything on it. But it, you, you are sort because of the the writer's guild or the show or the way that it works, it, it says your name. And there are other times where the whole group writes the episode and yet it has your name on it and and you didn't or, or you wrote somebody else's episode like there's so many ways where episodes you don't have any ownership of them so it's easy to be like well i didn't really like that one but i didn't do much or that one was bad and it's all my fault <laughs> like it's hard it's hard to say yeah. so i the bad ones you i i think you just move on i don't i don't really think about it yeah i think um i do think there's something really interesting about that which is that like some of them some of the episodes that have your name on it you you didn't really write and either and they turn out bad or good and that's sad for both you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, to and get I, credit for something you didn't do is like that as sucks. Um, so it, and it is again, it's it just is like an interesting part of our job, uh, which is that like your name goes on stuff and then it you never kind of know what happened. And I I there definitely were episodes along the way that I was like, that was really bad, or this was a bad experience, or I did a bad job and then I felt really badly about that. But I yeah. do think in the end. Now that I look back on it, I learned so much from each of those experiences that it's yeah, it's all right. And also, yes, Caroline and I are not going to out ourselves, even though I do feel like I talked about this <laughs> with this Anna, and I was like, you should ask us that. Now I'm like, why did I tell her that? That's a, I'm not going to say anyone's name out loud, but I, I think like yeah, um, I did a bad job. But anyway, um, but <laughs> I, I wrote it's an hard, episode it's hard. called Jack called um, Ruthie, which I loved. And that was just like a really spectacular experience in that I felt like I actually wrote that and loved what I wrote and which is so rare. Um, and then it was just like produced beautifully by by the rest of, you know, the staff and and the team. And also Kristen Bell was in it and because she it's all full circle for uh, Veronica Mars and that it was very special that she was part of this episode in which I actually felt a part of and not just like, oh, because I happen to be here, I'm working with this person. I was like, oh, I'm, I, I can be proud. And that's such a lovely experience. Yeah, that's one of the things that you never really get a chance to describe, which is your experience of this whole job is not unlike all of you guys who are not TV writers or who have no interest in being TV writers, your your experience of the job is very much based on the people. So like I could have had, it could be the worst show in the world. And if yeah. I was with great people, that's the job I, I love the most. Or if it was the best thing in the world and I, and I didn't like somebody or I didn't like, you know, I mean, they're all coworkers. So it, it's, you know, it's relative, but I do think you you think fondly of the the experience you had doing it as opposed to the final product. So true. Okay, I've got time for one last question from the audience. And this is sort of a combination of several questions we got. Uh, people are wondering, how do you get started in the entertainment industry? What's your advice? And then advice particularly for um, underrepresented minorities who are trying to get into writers room. Great yeah. Question. I mean, I think that I think right now is a, a really great time uh, to get into writing for underrepresented people. And I think there's like a lot of really cool organizations out there. And even though Caroline and I are against the Internet and social media, <laughs> Twitter has actually become this great place where, you know, there are writers out there who are offering to read people and there's they're kind of 
um, trying to have lists that other that writers are trying to share with each other. And I know I've personally heard from a lot of people of like, I'm looking for a person who can tell their story, um, you know, that is not white. And, and so kind of trying to go on to go online, go on to Twitter, find these organizations, find writers, um, and reach out to them. But I think the real piece of advice I have connects to that, which is if you want to write, you have to write and you have to write scripts and you have to put yourself out there and you have to share those scripts with other people and find as many ways as possible to be read and find a community. And I, I think like, you know, I, I was an assistant first and so I was getting to understand production. And I think that's also a great route, which is like, you know, working your way up and and meeting people and seeing how it's done. But I, it wasn't until I was able to say, here is a script that I wrote, you know, can you read it? Um, and can you like give me feedback? Was I able to be seen as a writer? And so unfortunately, the only way to do it is to actually do it. Um, and then also like like Caroline, if you make, can make a short film, any way to put yourself out there um, and it sort of to prove, to prove what your passion is and what your voice is. Um, yeah, advice. I, I, I second all of that. Number one is, is right. I feel like when you are somebody who doesn't get heard that that's such a hard, it, it, the second thing you said that really connected for me was the, the community, like you can't do it alone. And I think like if making that community, as far as like, if you take a, a writing class or if like you find a group online, make find other people and i think it is on people who are doing the hiring to hire different kinds of voices but i think part of it too the reason why the voices are i always sort of studied this is like mentorship is is a real thing and i think a lot of people move up in the business through through mentors sort of helping them and a lot of the voices are the same because the mentors help Thing, people that are like them and yet the business is and, and then you're stuck with a business full of the same and now that there are different kinds of people I see like mentorship happening I see if you reach out to I think I think at now people are open when you reach out to to writers that that inspire you that are that that are kind of what you want to do I feel like reaching out to people even if you can't get to the very top person, reaching out to other people that are just above, oh, you you made a short film, I can DM you and 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 see how you did it. And then suddenly you have a, a community and, and of people like you who deserve a shot. And then the more numbers there are, the more powerful you become. And then your voice will have to be heard. But I do feel like it it is really hard. I mean, I found it. But before I before I was hired, I found. I mean, and obviously, I'm not coming from the same place. But like community and classes, community, you know, playwriting classes or fiction writing classes or you know things that were at my school where, you know, professors who my first play was a professor who was submitting to this festival and I and she said you should submit as well. Like just instead of you know building up through other people i think is is what i wish i had had i wish i had had more of that and i whenever i did i never forget those people anyone who helped me i never forget them and i send them a very nice bottle of wine after no i'm kidding i don't give it but <laughs> if i ever begin if i ever win anything i will thank those people but anyway, i would just look for mentors right uh, and create communities so that there's power in numbers. Because we need people, you know? <laughs> yeah, Joanna and I are gonna die soon. So someone has to come in and take our place. <laughs> let's make it, let's make it somebody new and different and better. <laughs> well, thank you both. That's all the time we have. We really enjoyed hearing from you and having you answer our questions. Now, I'd like to welcome back our president, Cindy Tang, for some closing remarks. <laughs> Hi, Cindy. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, I'm back. Um, thank you, Joanna and Caroline, for such a fantastic and fun event. 
Um, and thank you to our audience for submitting so many wonderful questions as well. So to conclude at all of our events, our communications team puts together a custom poster for all of our speakers and today's event is no different. Um, so when we get back to campus, we will be printing out these posters, framing them and mailing them. But for now, we'll be presenting them to you virtually. Um, so this is tonight's poster. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. I love it. Thanks. <laughs> truly, thanks anybody for watching. Thank you for you. Thank you guys for organizing. Like what an amazing program. Everyone tune in and watch Dr. Fauci <laughs> because apparently yeah. he's coming soon. And Fauci. I don't, these girls wrangled some cool people on their <laughs> forum. So very impressed. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thanks, and guys. so thank you again to the audience for coming. Um, if you are willing and able, please fill out our feedback form so we can continue to make our events better and like us on Facebook and visit our website to learn more. As for upcoming events, as Caroline mentioned, Dr. Fauci will be coming in October, but more recently yes. next week, we have a panel on emergency response protocol at Berkeley um, featuring our very own Chancellor Christ. And on September 30th, we have Romton Aro Bluey um, coming with NPR. So please check out those events as well. And finally, if you're willing and able as well, please support us um, and any amount goes towards continuing to put on free events for everyone. But thank you so much again for coming out to tonight's event and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Berkeley.